The mandate was established uh, in 2005 uh, at the request that was then the Commission on Human Rights. For a number of years before that, a subsidiary body of the Commission, called the Subcommission, um, had been working on a draft code of conduct for corporations, transnational corporations and other businesses in relation to human rights. Uh, they sprung this on the Commission in 2004. It found no support among governments. Business was uniformly opposed. Some NGOs um, were wildly in favor because it promised to impose binding obligations on companies directly under international law uh, without addressing how that would be enforced. And, a, and a, a, a huge controversy erupted, which the Commission on Human Rights couldn't quite figure out how to resolve. So um, they gave the problem to somebody else. Um, they asked the Secretary General to appoint a special representative to look into the matter, uh, in, initially in a fact-finding manner. So my initial mandate that I was given in 2005 said, you know, go forth uh, and find out what is the nature of the problem. What are we talking about here uh, with regard to corporate-related human rights abuses? Well, we're talking about sweatshop conditions and factories that supply global brands. Uh, we're talking about communities that are forcibly displaced to make room for a mining operation uh, and, or, or an oil uh, facility. Uh, we're talking about food and beverages firms found with uh, seven-year-olds uh, working on sugar plantations or whatever the case may be, uh, or collaborating with paramilitary forces that are guarding their assets and uh, in the process are killing labor organizers. So the question, uh, how, how widespread is this problem? How big is it? Wh where, does it? where is it most likely to occur? And so on and so forth. That was one part of the initial fact-finding. Secondly, the question I was asked is, what are the, the standards that prevail currently? What, what are the obligations of states? Uh, and, and, and how are they being discharged? Um, what are the responsibilities um, of businesses themselves um, uh, with regard to, uh, to human rights? Um, and so uh, this initial two-year fact-finding um, mandate I came back to was in the Human Rights Council, uh, delivered a, a what we called a mapping report, uh, and they said, gee, this is very nice, thank you very much. You've identified a number of gaps, governance gaps, a number of holes in the system um, of, of protection. Could you please make some suggestions on what might be done to close those gaps, to fill those gaps? So I spent the next two years uh, with intensive consultations, enormous extensive research, um, Going around the world, um, we just finished our 26th international stakeholder consultation a week ago in Geneva, um, looking at the question of um, how do you begin to solve this problem? What does it make sense to propose? And then, so in 2008, I proposed what I called a policy framework to the Human Rights Council. Uh, this policy framework consists of three pillars. The first is the state duty to protect uh, against human rights abuses by third parties, including business. Uh, and it sort of showed how and why states don't do a good job um, of that. Secondly, um, the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, which um, I defined as um, a, a process of due diligence by companies to make sure they don't interfere or infringe upon the rights of others. And of course, we found that few companies have such a due diligence process, and so we laid out what the elements of it should be. Uh, and then thirdly, a, a, a great need for um, access to remedy, both judicial remedy and non-judicial remedy. Uh, judicial meaning courts, um, uh, non-judicial meaning mediation services, uh, grievance mechanisms at the site level, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I proposed this framework to the Human Rights Council in 2008, and lo and behold, um, in, a, in a, a rare act of unanimity, um, they uh, endorsed the framework and said, for sins committed in the previous life, would you please spend the next three years operationalizing this framework? That is to say, uh, coming back with very concrete guidance on what states should be doing and what, what companies should be doing in relation to those three principles. And that's the, the mission that I'm um, engaged in um, currently. Along the way, I have found, much to my um, pleasant surprise, 
that uh, a number of governments and a number of other um, official entities have already picked up on the framework th thus far and have applied it um, in a variety of ways. Uh, individual governments um, such as Norway and South Africa, for example, have used the framework to do their own policy assessments. They've actually created mechanisms to look at their own business and human rights policy structure and have asked the question, what, if, if, if this is what is supposed to happen, what are we doing that, that's right and what are we doing that isn't right in relation to that? And Norway has recently issued a white paper and the uh, South African government has recently come out with a policy assessment as well. Secondly, I've worked very closely with other uh, international entities like the OECD. Um, the OECD has something called Guidelines for Multinational Corporations to which is attached a complaints mechanism. Um, I've been um, encouraging the OECD for the last two years to update their guidelines, to bring them in line with this framework. Uh, the OECD has just agreed to do that and has invited my participation in the process. We're doing similar things with the EU. We're doing similar things with a number of regional organizations in the developing world. And so even before we're finished with the operationalization, there's been considerable uptake uh, indicating that there was a vacuum here that just needed to somehow to, to, to have um, some means of, of, of filling. Today, um, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, announce uh, a new project um, under the mandate. The worst of the worst human rights, corporate-related human rights abuses, take place in zones of conflict, um, where there is um, fighting over territory or over the government itself. Uh, this is uh, the type of context that attracts illicit enterprises who treat them as lawless zones. But even well-recognized branded firms can get drawn into uh, involvement in human rights abuses, uh, some of the most serious, um, uh, in including complicity in, in forced labor um, um, and, uh, and, 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 and genocide. Um, and so um, this is an area that is of particular concern to the mandate. Um, I um, am happy to announce today that a, a small but representative group of countries has joined with me in an informal off-the-record brainstorming session um, that um, is intended to address what innovative um, policy measures, uh, practical, administrative, as well as legal, um, I could propose to the Human Rights Council um, uh, for adoption with regard to such conflict zones. In other words, the governments will join me in a brainstorming session. They will bring their experiences to the table. We will pick and choose from what makes most sense. They don't want to be associated with any particular position, so they will become my positions and I will forward them then to the Human Rights Council so that governments don't have to reflect their national position when they participate uh, in this process. Just very briefly, um, the countries that have so far agreed to participate, it's an interesting list. It includes Belgium, Brazil, Canada, China, Colombia, Guatemala, Nigeria, Norway, Sierra Leone, Switzerland, the UK, and the United States. Uh, the first meeting will be held at the beginning of December. Um, one final point, if, if I may, I know I'm going to be asked the question, so I might as well anticipate it. I get it asked all the time. That, you know, what about the Chinese companies um, in, Af in Africa and, and, and in Latin America? And look at what they're doing. And it's one thing to put pressure on, on Shell or, or, or Nike, but what about the Chinese companies? My answer to that is this. When North American firms, mining companies, first started to go to the Andean region, for example, their operations were run by cowboys who thought they'd never left Denver or Calgary. And they did a miserable job and made a mess of things. It took time for them to figure out that they weren't in Denver and Calgary anymore uh, and that they had to change their ways. My aim in this project is to shorten the learning curve significantly and to make sure that everybody does learn. So why don't I leave it at that? Thank you very much. Uh,